Good morning. We have uh, two main uh, points that we need to cover in our introduction to the book of Revelation, and hopefully we can get through that today. Uh, we want to look at, uh, finally, the different uh, approaches to the book of Revelation, and then I want to give you not a rigid outline of the book, but like a narrative of the book chapter by chapter, and hopefully that will uh, help us see a little clearer the detailed message of it, and to be able to apply those details uh, to our lives. All right. When we talk about the different approaches, we, we touched on this last week. Uh, the first approach to the book of Revelation is called the preterist approach. The preterist approach. The word, I'm sorry. Spell it, P-R-E, T, okay. Hey, and, hey, we'll do this every time. If you'll take notes, I'll spell the word. That sounds like a good deal to me. Preterist, P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T, P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T, preterist. I? Yes, I-S-T. And that word simply means past, past. The preterist system of interpretation uh, is divided in two ways. There are extreme preterists, and there are more moderate preterists. The advocates of the extreme preterist position believe that the book of Revelation was written before AD 70, before the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, generally dated around 67 or 68, and that the entire book, generally speaking, was fulfilled in the fall of Jerusalem in August of AD 70. I am not an extreme preterist. Believe that the book was written later. Uh, there are two wings to the preterist uh, position. A more modern approach is that the book, the things, the events of the book of Revelation were written before, but not as early as before 870, like in the last decade of the first century, like around 81 to 96. I take that position. That's when I believe that the book was written. Under the reign of Domitian, uh, who of course was the Roman emperor at the time. There are lots that could be said about these different methods, but we won't say lots. We'll just give a general counsel so we understand uh, generally what these positions are, are saying. The second one is the futuristic or the eschatological method. Eschatology just means final things. The end times. You hear a lot of people talking about the signs of the times and the end is near. They are talking about things that are eschatological. The final things. And so the futuristic method holds that generally the things in the book of Revelation have not been fulfilled yet, and especially chapters 4 through the first half of chapter 20, that those things are yet future. That, uh, you know, the dragon and the tribulation and 666 and all of that is yet future. The futuristic method. Uh, two questions need to be pointed out, as we've pointed these out before. If the book of Revelation is yet future, what message or encouragement did that have to the initial recipients? And how is one to know, right? How is one to know when that time period is just prior to Christ's second coming, when all these things will take place? 
Oh no, there is a great, there is a great fulfillment of these things in the, uh, in the end of the first century and the beginning of the second century. So that's a second approach to this book. There's the preterist approach, two different sets to the preterist approach, and the futuristic approach. Number three, there is the continuous historical method of interpretation. And this method reasons that Revelation is a forecast of the church's history and fortunes from John's time to the end of time. So this view would find in the book of Revelation uh, Mohammedism, the Dark Ages, uh, World War II, Hitler, uh, Iran, Iraq today, and on and on and on, trying to make a continuous historical approach to the book of Revelation. There are lots of problems with this approach. And, and, and I guess where this really took up steam in the church, how many of you remember carrying a commentary written by B.W. Johnson? Johnson's commentary. Well, this was his approach to the book of Revelation. And I know in adult classes when I was, when I was smaller, everybody, not everybody, a lot of people had Johnson's commentary. Uh, I believe Johnson was a member of the Christian Church, a, a conservative uh, member of the, of the independent Christian Church. But he wrote a concise commentary on the New Testament, and the notes were right there, and it was real convenient to have. This was his approach to Revelation. And uh, some in the church have adopted this view, but again, uh, what meaning would all that have to uh, answering the questions of the people in John's day. When will this end? Uh, and it did end. Another approach to the book of Revelation is the philosophy of history. The philosophy of history method. This is more of a spiritual kind of thing where everything in the book is spiritualized and there's no application to any detailed event or person. In other words, the great dragon of the book of Revelation is not Rome, it's um, evil, just general evil. You see, it, it takes a highly spiritual approach to the book of Revelation. Uh, there's the historical background method of interpretation, and this claims that the events in Revelation were fulfilled in the first two or three centuries. However, they differ from the preterists. In that they see a definite message for all time in the detail of the book. Well, which one is should be fully adopted? None of them. None of them. There's probably a little bit of all of them that should be adopted, and that's why we call this the eclectic method of interpretation. Is there any prophecy of the, that is yet future in the book of Revelation? Yeah. What about the last two chapters? Christ hasn't come yet. The judgment scene hasn't unfolded yet. So there is a futuristic idea to the book of Revelation. What about chapters 4 through 19? Have they been fulfilled? Yes. So the total futuristic or eschatological method is not correct. And these others that pinpoint the detail of the book of Rome, that's not correct. But there's a kernel of truth in all of these. And so if we're going to put this in a nice, neat package, I guess the package is that none of the common packages are totally accurate and precise. So we need a type of eclectic approach, which means that it's composed of materials that are gathered from many systems, from, from, these, uh, from these spiritual systems. All right. Brother Matt. Yes, sir. Wouldn't that it be made clear by the third verse of the first chapter of Revelation, where it says, Blessed is he who reads 
and hears the words of this prophecy and keeps those things and does those, these things in this book that is continuous that we do. When I well, hear and learn. I don't know that that verse is going to help us, you know, pinpoint which approach is right. I mean, the principle is certainly right. We'll be blessed if we read and study it. And there's application of that, but we've got to we've got to decide in our minds, you know, when we're reading chapter four, is that yet future? Is that now? Has that already been established? And I think the only way to do that is to study the whole book and put it in the context of the first century. We should do this with every book. This is rightly dividing the word of truth. What did it mean, first of all, to the original recipients of the book? That is vital. That is vital. Now, there still can be some blessings that come from reading it and studying it. That's why I don't know that that, uh, that, that verse tells us exactly. It gives us a general approach in that in, as far as knowing that you're going to be blessed by doing it. But when do these chapters, when, when are they fulfilled? Yes. There's another verse that's almost the end of Revelation that says, Blessed is Blessed is he keeps his commandments. Yes. That keeps his commandments. That he may have a right to the tree of life. So right. I believe that is home to go with. Yes. Oh, and sure. And fits my life. Oh, sure. And there are, and that's what we're saying. There are applications that must be made in our day and time to the general principle of the book. But as far as the detailed uh, ideas of that book, they have been fulfilled. That is not continued. So it, it depends on you know what area here we're talking about. Uh, yes, there has to be, and see, this is a problem with many times why the church doesn't want to deal with the book of Revelation. Some believe, especially the extreme preterists, believe that it's already passed, that it was done, the message was given to, uh, uh, to Christians at the destruction of Jerusalem, period. So you might as well cut it out today. I think that's a very extreme position, especially if if, uh, uh, if the first chapter applies to us today, then there is application that we can make from the whole book. But generally speaking, in principle, not in the part that has been detailed, that, there, that there's been fulfillment in the detail of. And we're going to see this as we go on in the text. We'll, we'll see it more clearly. Don't worry. Yes? How do, if that's their approach, how do they explain the last chapter of Revelation? All that, well, as you well know, have you been raptured yet? Your rapture? The great Are tribulation? Are they raptured? Physical, literal events in their minds of the futuristic approach? That's still future to them. The whole book of Revelation, except for the first three chapters, the letters written to the churches, 4 through 19 is yet future. The truth of the matter is 4 through 19 has been fulfilled. That's where the rub lies in the basic interpretation. So when you hear people still, you know, looking forward to the rapture, and this car will be left driverless, you know, if the rapture occurs, and, and all of that stuff, they are, that's a futuristic approach to the book. But that futuristic approach to the book, as we'll see through the study of it, contradicts. That's why we went through all those scriptures, those clear passages of scriptures that teach us that the kingdom is now. It's not yet future. See, that's another thing about the futuristic approach. The kingdom's not here yet, folks. You're not in the kingdom yet. You're just in the church. And that's really not a big deal if you're in the church now or not. Can you believe that? The scriptures that we've read, that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood, that there's no church of anybody's choice in the New Testament. There was only one. We'll talk a little bit about that next, next hour. But yes, the futuristic approach or method to the book of Revelation totally, totally, uh, messes up many clear passages of Scripture. That does not, those things have been fulfilled, and the enemy there, in, in, uh, the major enemy in chapters 4 through 19, is Rome. 
And we'll see that. We'll see that. But yes, the application of how they were to remain faithful apply to us today. Yes, Rome and that persecution that was brought upon the church can be applied to any persecution that you and I may suffer today. There's your continuous idea in the book of Revelation, but not in the detail of it. Not in the detail. You know, I've had people say, what difference does premillennialism really make? Well, if, you know, Christ comes up and he sets up, because it contradicts the clear, clear passage of Scripture, and it implies that Christ was a failure first time when he came, and he couldn't set up the kingdom because the Jews rejected him, and so he set up this more insignificant institution called the church. And that's why people don't care what church you go to. That's where that's based. That's, all, that's where it's based, that idea. That it really doesn't matter. Well, you and I know from clear passages of Scripture that those things do matter. In fact, they're essential. <coughs> right? They're essential. So hopefully we can see this. All right. Any other questions about the different methods? I think that's about all of them. There are about six of them. All right. Here we go. Here's a little narrative that will take us from the beginning of the book of Revelation to the end. And I think this is going to put it in a little clearer context for us. The stage is what? Where is the stage? Patmos. And what was Patmos known for? Exile. And where was Patmos? 70 miles, <laughs> 70 miles southwest of Ephesus. You guys are good. You know how many Revelation classes I could step into in the church and start a class and ask those questions, and I wouldn't get any answers. So you are learning. This is good. This is good. All right, what was John doing on Patmos? He was banished. He was exiled to Patmos. And why was he exiled to Patmos? This is huge. Why was he banished to Patmos? He was preaching the word, and guess what? The Roman Empire didn't do banishment in 87. Nero didn't banish people. Nero just burned them. He didn't banish people. Well, why does that make a difference? Well, I guess it's a little insight where the book was written. Domitian banished. Domitian banished a lot. And John was part of that banishment. And the book of Revelation is in a difficult message. Have you read it yet? Have you, have you, have you studied the figures yet? If you get the figures, you're going to see it's an easy message. It's an easy message. What makes it difficult? John had to write in signs because if Rome got a hold of this letter and they could understand all of it, they would come after John and his followers. So John had to keep the message from Rome but deliver it to the Christians. And we've done that many times. We've talked in signs. If we're trying, if in our presence there's a group that we don't want to get the message. You know, when you and your wife go to somebody's house and you want to leave, and you have these magic code words that you say to your spouse, to me, all right, let's get out of Dodge. You know, you're keeping the message from some people, but you want to deliver the message to others. This is exactly how John is writing the Revelation. Exactly. All right, so... John is here on Patmos. He's writing as he's sitting in the audience. And he's viewing a play. He's at the Fox Theater of Patmos. And he's watching this play of heaven unfold before him. John is not in heaven. Okay. He's seeing a figurative play or depiction of heaven. Now, a cursory reading of the Revelation would not bring one to that conclusion. But we are not cursory students, right? It's not nice to curse. 
So we're going to go, we're going to dig a little deeper. We're going to do a muscle and a shovel approach here so we can understand. All right, the stage is Patmos, uh, a relatively insignificant rocky island about 70 miles southwest of Ephesus. It serves as a place of exile for Roman prisoners, and this little known island has been made immortal. Reagan brought me back a t shirt from Patmos that has like a little picture of the cave on it and, a, and it's been marketed. I mean, it's, that's what it's known for the vision of John. Remember, we sing a song about the beautiful, holy white city that John saw. Uh, okay. He saw it not literally coming down from heaven, he saw a play as he is exiled on Patmos. All right. And John was in the spirit, Revelation 1.10 tells us, on the Lord's day. And we'll get into a debate when we get there if that's Sunday or not. All right? Don't ask now. We'll get there. We're doing this overview first. We'll get through this. This little known island was made uh, immortal by the vision in AD 96, approximately. So let's share with John, okay, our spiritual ancestor. Let's go into the Fox Theater of Patmos, and let's look at this play. Okay, I'm going to take the crib notes of this play, and I want you to listen to this as we go through the book of Revelation. And try to absorb as much of this as you can, because when we go into it chapter by chapter in more detail, you'll understand the general idea of what is being talked about. and see if this makes sense or not. So we're going to share with John our spiritual brother. And doesn't the book of Revelation start out by saying our brother and what? Our brother where? Not in Patmos here. But our brother where? Look at verse uh, 9. Our companion and fellow laborer where? All my goodness. He's our companion, uh, companion, brother, fellow laborer where? In the kingdom. Futuristic method. Automatically down the commode right now. He's in the kingdom. Do you mean the kingdom was established at the time John wrote this? The kingdom's not yet future? Folks, that's huge. Are we going to let the Bible speak? That's huge. That, that probably casts out three of these approaches right now. Just on the face of it. After all, if you're going to have a kingdom, what must you have? King. You can't have a kingdom without a king. And some of the folks that talk about the kingdom is not yet still refer to Jesus as King Jesus. Listen, in order to have a kingdom, you have a king. In order to have a king, you have to have a kingdom. Jesus said in Mark 9, 1, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Jesus said there will be some that stand here that will not die till they see the kingdom come with power. And with one voice, I hope that we can tell the world when that kingdom came. When was it? In Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost. That's when it came. That's when the power came, right? Jesus told the, the apostles before he ascended you go wait in Jerusalem until you receive what? Power from on high. And what did that power enable them to do? Preach the gospel in languages that they hadn't studied. And to preach it in Arabic. And to bring to Jesus and bring to their attention everything that Jesus had told them. None of us qualify for that today, do we? We weren't alive then. But that's what this power did when the kingdom came. And that's why Jesus would pray, not in his personal prayer, but when he was teaching uh, the people to pray, thy kingdom come. You know, it's interesting. Every time before Acts 2, the kingdom's in future tense. Every time after Acts 2, the kingdom is in past tense. Why? 
Because the kingdom was established on the day of Pentecost, it's still here. And we are fellow laborers with John, 80, 91, or, um, 80 96, 81 to 96. If you want to date the book anywhere from 81 to 96, we'll stay in fellowship with you. <laughs> you get much earlier than that, we've got to talk a little bit. We've got to talk a little bit. All right. So, here we are with John. We're watching the play of the fox at Patmos. And first of all, in Revelation chapter 1, we're introduced to Jesus. All right? Chapter 1. We're introduced to Jesus. We're introduced to the scope of his ministry and the present glorious reign of Jesus in the kingdom on David's throne in I might have heard something. I need to hear it a lot louder. Where is David's throne and Jesus is sitting on it? Oh, good. All right. I was afraid I might hear Jerusalem. Glad I didn't hear that. That's huge. What did we see in Jeremiah 21? That no one of the seed of Jeconiah, who was Jeconiah, He was an ancestor of Christ. What did he do? Who was Jeconiah? He's a king. Yes, he was a king of Judah, right? In the list of the 20 kings of Judah, he was number 19. He was next to last. Right before Zedekiah. Jeremiah says that there would be no one of the seed of Jeconiah that would prosper anymore sitting on David's throne, now watch this, in Jerusalem. Well, our futuristic friends say that when Jesus comes again and sets up the kingdom, he's going to be sitting, I mean, literally, Jesus' literal body is going to be sitting on a literal chair well, we don't have chairs up there. We have benches, but you know the point. In Jerusalem. And he's going to sound the time when you and I are going to fight and pick up swords and fight the battle of Armageddon. And the Jews are going to get another chance to obey the gospel. See, that's why you have some of these uh, Christian groups led by John Hagee and others that really want to protect Jerusalem because they see the signs of the times and the end is near and Jesus is coming soon and all that stuff. The problem we have is that there will be nobody present to convert the Jews because they've already been caught up. Oh, they've already been raptured. Yeah, that's the last half of it. Years. Oh, and by the way, this method says in chapters 4 through 19, that all takes place within a seven-year period. All of it. We'll get there later. Yeah. Who's, who's going to be converting the Jews at this time? The good guys, at least during this time, are raptured up. Paul was a Jew and he had already been converted. That's right. He was converted and John's in the kingdom here. Crazy, crazy stuff. See, you can get a lot of fantastic, fabulous stories from the book of Revelation, depending on what slant you want to put on. You know? All right, so here we are. We're introduced to Jesus in chapter 1, and we behold the Lord now as he walks through the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, and he's noticing the lampstands and the candlesticks, and we listen as he dictates letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. There are more churches around, folks. There are a lot more than seven. Okay, but these letters were written to those seven in Asia Minor, all the while applying what we should do, applying these principles to the 21st century church. Applying the principle, not the detail. That's how you do prophecy. Okay, let me ask you something. The great dream of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, you remember, right? The head of gold, 
right? The breast of silver and on the... Is there an application of that to us today? Yeah, there's an application. How many of you apply that thing literally? Is that a dream that anybody has today? Do those nations have anything to do with nations today? When you deal with prophecy, you're dealing with a different bird altogether. When you're dealing with figurative language, and we've spent weeks now talking about this, when you're dealing with figurative language, there's a different approach to that. There is a method to how you ascertain the difference between figurative and literal language. It sounds to me like it's all just a bad discernment of the physical versus the spiritual. It is. It is. It's a hermeneutical problem. What does the word hermeneutics mean? The science. That means you know it. The science of biblical interpretation. If it's spiritual hermeneutics. And part of that, there are precise rules that we follow, and we've already mentioned probably two or three of those already this morning. You never interpret a figurative passage as the foundation passage. You always interpret figurative stuff in light of the clear stuff. So I know that any passage, any figurative passage, that might be thought that the kingdom is yet future cannot be a correct interpretation of the clear context of Scripture and the more literal passages. Tell me what? The kingdom's here. The kingdom's here. So I don't change what I know from literal passages. I change my view on the more obscure figurative passages. That just makes sense, doesn't it? <coughs> and so that's how we have to approach a figurative book, the most figurative in all of the Bible, like Revelation. All right. So after chapters, after chapter three, as we're with John, we're beside John in the audience, seeing this panoramic view of heaven. Beginning in chapter four, then we see John. We see with John a door opening into heaven. This is neat. This is really neat. Remember when Paul was taken up to the third heavens and when he came back, he wasn't allowed to say anything? It was so holy. It was so... God did not want that message out. And also because Paul thought that if he taught people that he knew this, he could be elevated. And interesting point there as well. But here we're getting another glimpse. The door is opening, and inside there is a majestic throne of the universe and of all the creation, and it's paying homage to him who occupies the throne. That's Revelation 4. That's all it is. There's a lot of figurative stuff, and that's all that that is. All right? Now, it's important that we not get ahead of ourselves in these figures and understand the general scope of what's being discussed. The glory of God, the one who sits on the throne, and there's going to be just great dis description of the Savior in Revelation 4. Don't read anything more in that. That's what that is. All right. So amid the praises of the heavenly beings, the Bible says, one like unto a lamb takes a closed, seven-sealed book from the throne. The occupant's hand. And John weeps because there's no one in heaven to open it. Nobody is worthy to open it. No one in heaven, no one on earth is able, but he is told that the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to open it. And he's looking for a lion, a lamb that takes the book and in Revelation 5, he begins to loosen those seals. Now, we've gone through, generally speaking, the first five chapters of the book of Revelation. Now, keeping grounded and keeping stable and keeping all of this in the context of the rest of the Bible, I want to ask you a question. Have we said anything here that is so theological advanced that we can't understand this 
and Revelation is a bad book. See, see what I've done in the first five chapters? I've just taken the, the figure of language out. This is not a big principle book. It just really isn't. We can understand that, right? We're seeing this play. We're seeing the glory of Christ on the throne. We're seeing a seven-sealed book that John is crying because there's no one worthy to open this but Jesus. Wow. You didn't think Revelation was that easy, did you? That's all that this is. And there's a lot of fantastic language to describe all this. All right. Hang in there. The rest is going to be this easy, too. We're filled with awe as we find out that the Lion of the tribe of Judah can open this book. So then, four horsemen come out of the book each playing a role in the drama that's happening between you and me and John. <clears throat> Souls are crying out from beneath an altar, and this is their cry. Lord, how long is this going to take place? How long are we going to suffer Roman persecution at the hand of Domitian? How long? And the answer is, well, you know, this has something to do with Adolf Hitler and Iran and Iraq in the latter 80s, right? Who can thunk it? How long do you not avenge our blood, they were told? What was the answer? Yet for a little season. Not 2,000 years. <coughs> Yet for a little season. After the sixth of the seven seals was opened, an earthquake representative of the nations running from the judgment of God is seen. End of Revelation 6. Hard to read. When did you get this little book with all of the definitions of all the figures in Revelation? Oh, we're going to be in hog heaven. We're going to see how easy this book really is. All right. The six seals open. Here's the earthquake. Represent the judgment of God. We see then that provision is made for the church, the redeemed, the kingdom. These servants receive a seal upon their foreheads. Have you heard our futurists talk about this being sealed on the forehead? Well, the number of earth on the seal on their head were numbered, and the number was 144,000. So, our literalist, futurist friends say, some of them say, only 144,000 are going to heaven. Guess what? Most of them say that number's been reached. You and I can't go. It's all Jews. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're all virgins. I can't go. <laughs> I can't. I don't qualify there either. Most of you don't either. <laughs> well, you don't have to. Once saved, always saved, right? See, on and on it goes. On and on it goes. All right. 144,000. 144,000 is 12 twelves, right? Isn't that right? What's the number? What's the figure to... Definition of the number 12 in Scripture. What do we say? See, I'm glad I'm going to hand you this sheet out in a week or two. Yeah. Extreme complete. Seven's complete. Twelve is extreme. Twelve twelves. The complete number in heaven, not a little 144,000. Listen, folks, I don't, I'm not sure. That when John, when Jesus is speaking through John to the seven churches of Asia, that that's literally seven churches. And we'll argue about that later too. But here we go. Um, the complete number of God's people on earth. And it's called a great multitude in heaven. So overwhelmed by this event 
that they begin to worship God. Many of our songs, holy, 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 all of these songs has its root in Revelation 7. It's just the worship of Jesus. Anybody not understand that concept? That's easy. That's easy. But you see, when you begin to put dragons and, and 144,000 figures and time and time and half the time, which, you know, we'll talk about all that later, it just kind of, ah. Uh, see, that's what, that's what gets us away. But the, the message of the book is easy. It's easy. All right. After the seventh seal is open and the seven trumpets sound, the first four of those sounding of the trumpets comprise chapter 8. The sounding of these trumpets are warnings which mark the beginning of the destruction. <clears throat> the Roman destruction. In the first century. In the first century. Now keep the historical context. Before... Titus, the Jews were taxed that heavily. You know, they were paying their taxes. That was their contribution to the temple. When Titus and Vestation and Omission reign, they made them take that temple tax and give it to Rome. And it was at this time that the emperors began demanding worship. In fact, they were given a certificate. It was good for one year. When, when you did this, you basically acknowledged Caesar as God. You know, as rotten as Nero was, he didn't, he didn't demand that. And that's why you have in Sir B, faithful unto death. The fifth, sixth, and seventh sounding of the trumpets, that's chapters 9 through 11. These are just warnings. They're just warnings. With the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the curtain falls on part one of the play as we're watching it with John on Patmos. And this is the great divide of the book of Revelation. First 11 chapters, well, actually, the first three chapters, right? Letters of seven churches. And then 4 through 11 is the first part of the play. And then 12 through the end of the book. So, at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the curtain falls on part one of our play. John then continues, and we with him on Patmos are looking at this play. And he continues to see this panoramic view in the second part of the book, chapters 12 through basically chapter 20, verse 15, involves the conflict between the church and Rome, between the church and this persecution. A woman, a child, and a dragon now are the central figures of this second part of the book. They represent the church, faithful Israel, Christ, and Satan, respect, uh, respectively. There's a conflict that follows in heaven in chapter 12 and in the wilderness. You and I are in the wilderness now. The church was in the wilderness in the first century. As Satan tries to destroy Christ and his people. Remember, Satan tried to destroy Christ when he was born with the slaughtering of the male infants. Satan calls two of his allies into the fight. A beast from the sea, chapter 13, which represents, or it has ten horns, which was Rome. And we can see Daniel chapter 7, verses 19 and 20 for this. And a beast from the earth, a beast from the sea, and a beast from the earth. In chapter 13, the, 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 the beast of the earth represented the deceptive representatives of the Roman Empire, which, by the way, could include the papacy. Could, we'll talk about that later. Did I hear a bell? Yeah. 
Yes, you what? did. Is that the first one? What was that yes. word? Okay, <clears throat> the popes. Remember that the church, the Catholic Church, is modeled much on the Roman hierarchy and all of that cardinal order. We'll, we'll get into that later. Well, this beast had a mark on it. The mark of the beast. I'm sure most of you have heard of the mark of the beast. What was the mark? It had three numbers. Six. Yes, six, six, six. Saw a bumper sticker a few weeks ago. That's all it said, 666. Six, six. I don't know what he was trying to say. He was evil. If you're evil, say, I don't know what it was, 666. Six, six. What is the number that that is defined six in the, or, or what's the principle that defines six in figured language? Why sinister or evil? What is seven? Complete. So six is incomplete, less than complete. And it takes on the idea of, of, of evil. So if it's six, it's evil. If it's six, 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 it's what? Really evil. Yeah. What's this mark on the beast? It's not a literal beast. And it's been fulfilled. And it was fulfilled in Rome in the first century. Well, the triumph of the saints are seen over these enemies, it's assured. The 144,000 that were sealed earlier in the vision are now shown safely at home with the Lamb. Is that hard? Take the figurative language out of it. It's not very hard at all. Or understand the figurative language. It is a, it is a clear understanding of what has been said in Scripture before. From a prophetic standpoint. All right. Not done yet. I heard a second bell. Right? Yeah, well... <laughs> How do I stop now? I mean, we're right in the middle of the most important part. All right. <laughs> Seven more angels are presented. It's going to tell basically the same story, folks. All this is. Are you beginning to see maybe that the only difficult thing about this is the figurative language that we're not used to using? You can understand the book of Revelation. It's part of the truth, and Jesus says you can know it. It just takes a muscle and a shovel sometimes, or a little different shovel. Maybe this just takes a spade. Thank you for listening. We'll pick up there next week. <laughs>